you, Mr. Chief of Walker, be here for that honor. Pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you so much. All right. I need a motion to adopt the agenda or if there are any edits. So moved. No. Well, we'll just, we'll just. That was my bad. That's okay. okay. No one has seconded it. No one has seconded it. So do we have any edits to the adoption of the agenda? Ms. Player. I would like to make the motion to move um, item two, the resolution to celebrate celebrates Hispanic Heritage Month um, in the award of recognition as part E, or before the director's report. Second. All right. All those in favor, please raise your hand. Okay. Thank you. Thank uh, you. I probably could have done them all together, but we're doing them separately since there's so many. Um, Ms. Masters? I'd like to remove item 1B11, the Sown to Grow contract. Okay. And then Ms. Tyler, do we have any removals to the consent agenda? Thank you. I'd like to pull 1B4. All right, so we have um, taken care of moving item two to after the awards and recognitions. We have two additional items from the consent agenda to be pulled to be discussed. Can I get a first, can I get a uh, motion for that? A motion to approve the agenda as amended. Second. All those in uh, favor, please raise your hand. Thank you unanimously. I appreciate it. Thank you, everyone. All right, we are first going to start off our meeting with the always exciting and probably one of our favorite parts of the meeting, the awards and recognitions, and we have a number of them. Uh, always good news happening at MMPS, and so I will let Dr. Battle start that off. Oh, no, I'm starting that off. My, I usually let Dr. Battle start it off, but it's me this time, guys. All right, so uh, the first thing that we have is the Davidson County Legislative Delegation Proclamation, which we are so appreciative of, and we are really excited about it. So tonight we have several of these exciting awards, and before I turn it over to Dr. Battle, and I apologize for that confusion, may I please have State Senator Cindy, uh, Heidi Campbell to deliver this recognition on behalf of the Davidson County Legislative De Delegation. Excuse me for stumbling on that. Great. Thank you so much, and thank you all for everything you do. It's good to see you. Very good to see all of you sitting here. Uh, so over the summer, we learned that MMPS and, of course, exams exceeded all expectations, achieving level fives in system-wide literacy, numeracy, and that has not been done since before 2015. And a social studies grade of four, which is the highest score since 2016. Of the 132 district-run schools, there were 40 42 level five composite schools, which is over a third of our schools, 51 schools with a four or a five composite, and 86 schools with a level three, four, or five. Since these achievements were announced, the good news has gotten even better, with even more schools making advances. 48 MMPS schools are now reward schools, and two schools have moved from priority status to reward status. Truly remarkable accomplishments and proof that local districts know how to get the job done. As chair of the Davidson County delegation, my fellow legislators and I were thrilled to issue a statement of congratulations to the district. I'd like to read it to you all now. We could not be prouder of Nashville's students, teachers, and staff for what they achieved on their end of year tests. Student growth is not preordained. It takes dedication, resolve, and hard work in the best of times. Coming out of the pandemic, the progress we're seeing in Metro Nashville Public Schools is even more remarkable. These outcomes show us what's possible when our educators have the classroom resources they need to help our kids be successful. President Biden's American 
Rescue Plan infused almost $300 million of COVID-19 relief into Nashville schools, which should serve as a reminder to the state that Nashville teachers can do wonders when they either have the support and have the respect of all of our state leaders. So once again, on behalf of the Davidson County delegation, congratulations to all of the students, teachers, staff, and parents for their amazing achievement and commitment to our children and their education. And I have a signed letter here to share with you from the Davidson County delegation. so much to Senator Campbell. I apologize for first calling you just by your first name and having to correct myself. Um, but thank you so much for also your support of us as MPS, not just now in this situation, but in the past and along with all the delegation, you've been really helpful to us as a delegation um, when we have had ongoing questions or concerns, of course, within the state and having to work on that. We are really proud of the work that MPS has done and the achievement that we've had. Um, so we really appreciate that. And if you're okay with it, do you mind coming up here? Here, so uh, we can take a photo with you as we typically do during awards and recognitions. Absolutely. Okay. Do you want to hold us up there? Yeah. I guess we all can because it's all of us as a board. But it doesn't matter. so much, Ms. Elrod. Again, thank you to Senator uh, Campbell and the entire um, delegation um, for your support and just celebrating um, all of our wonderful students and staff um, and leadership here in uh, Metro National Public Schools. We greatly appreciate it. So next we have um, East Nashville Magnet High School's Avery Patton, who has been named the TSSAA 2021-22 Boys Basketball Coach of the Year. Let's give him a round of applause. Coach Patton, say put, I have to make you blush just a little bit. <laughs> so, as you all know, Coach Patton led the East Nashville Eagles to the 2022 TSSAA Class 2A State Championship. This prestigious honor is based on his positive work with the student athletes in the East Nashville basketball program. And TSSAA will be submitting Coach Patton's name to the National Federation of State High School Associations for further honors at the sectional and national level. What you might not know is that Coach Patton is an MMPS alumnus, having graduated from Glencliff High School, and he was an All-American basketball player for Trevecca Nazarene University, where he scored over 2,400 points and dished out over 600 assists. He is also a member of the Trevecca Athletics Hall of Fame. 
Coach Patton, thank you for your excellent work with our student athletes and for your dedication to Metro Nashville Public Schools. You make us so proud with your success on and off the court. And now, um, if you don't mind, Coach Patton, we would like to get a quick picture with you. And then I believe I saw Principal Myra Taylor here also representing um, East High School. Um, if you can come and join us in the photo as well. But let's give him another round of applause for this honor. There's um, yes. <laughs> 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 also have the pleasure of recognizing a group of employees who work on behalf of all of MMPS employees and who have won a national award for their tremendous effort. In a few weeks, members of our human resources team will go to Bethesda, Maryland to receive the inaugural Carolyn C. Mattingly Award for Mental Health in the Workplace from the John Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health and the Love You Project. Here are a few of the initiatives and innovations by our team that the award evaluators took note of. The removal of barriers to health care for employees, particularly the removal of cost sharing for all mental health services for teachers. In 2019, all co-payments for any mental health office visits for teachers, whether in person or virtual, were removed. The establishment of the five Vanderbilt and MPS employee and family health care centers, especially the variety of surfaces offered, high utilization rates, and the no-cost model that removes all co-payments for covered teachers. Our wide range of wellness programs and services to meet a variety of employee needs and to meet our team MMPS members where they are. A robust communication of services through multiple channels. A mental health and wellness survey conducted in the first quarter of 2022 to guide our future direction. This survey found that nearly nine and 10 participants agreed that the available mental health benefits were helpful to them and to their families. A high dosage, excuse me, usage of the employee assistance program and MMPS demonstration of a culture of data-driven assessment, analysis, and response to employee mental health needs and risk factors, particularly the focus on health disparities and social determinants of health, as well as our strategic alignment of programs and services to meet employees' needs. Now, our team has worked hard to meet MPS employees where they are and to remove barriers to access to physical and mental health care. Employees and their family members can engage with health care professionals in a variety of ways, including in-person, telephonic, virtual, and app-based opportunities for care. We want our employees to have every opportunity to take care of themselves so that they can continue to do great work for our students and families. I'm thrilled that our first-rate HR team is being honored for its own great work to make these benefits possible. So I would like to give a huge congratulations to John C. Holt, our MMPS Director of MMPS Employee Wellness. Can you come on up, John C.? John C., thank you. Paula Pendergrass, our Chair of the Teachers Insurance Trust. Nettie, our Director of Clinic Operations for Vanderbilt Health at MPS. And our wonderful David Hines, our Executive Director of Employee Benefits. Um, he's unable to be with us tonight, so we're wishing him a speedy recovery. But let's give this team another round of applause and thank them for their leadership. 
thank you. I mean, really innovating, leading, um, taking care of our team. Um, I just love hearing all the ideas and the research and the data around what we're doing next, and it's paying off um, for us. And again, congratulations on this national recognition. If you all can come on up, we'd love to take a photo with you and wish you safe travels to Maryland to receive your award. I think Hank was trying to get in contact with you. I think Hank was trying to get in contact with you. And I might um, also, as they're walking back to their seats, give them another shout out that because of their great work and what they're leading here in Nashville, um, it recruited a special someone to Nashville last week to speak on this topic um, of, of health. And um, if you didn't hear about it, Serena Williams was in town last week. Um, MPS was a part of this celebration because of the great work and the partnership um, with Cigna. So y'all, they're doing great work. It's getting the attention of, of everyone. And again, kudos to the entire team. Thanks. Thank All right, you. I think I have... I was going to say, you want to do the next one? Yeah, sure. Okay. I'll jump in. Okay. Um, Finally, we have a very special group of music teachers with us tonight. So every year, the CMA Foundation honors music teachers of excellence from across the country. These are teachers who have huge impact on their students and their school communities. Our incredible MMPS music teachers are always well represented among the music teachers of excellence. And this year was no exception. Last week, the CMA Foundation honored the following teachers at a ceremony featuring U.S. Secretary of Education, Miguel. Cordona. Please come on up to the podium as I call your names and then we would like you to stay so we can take a quick picture. All right, first up we have Alicia Ingram from Eagle View Elementary. John Hazlett from McGavick High School. Trey Jacobs from Nashville School of the Arts. <laughs> Tyler Meredith, Meredith from Hillwood High School. <laughs> Samantha Reed, Oliver Middle School. <laughs> Emily Raleigh from Julia Green Elementary. Danielle Lee Taylor from Tusculum Elementary. <laughs> Susan Waters, MNPS music coach. <laughs> and last but not least, Frank Zimmerman from Antioch High School. <laughs> So I know they were celebrated in a big way last week, but congratulations to all of these amazing teachers, leaders on a job very well done. And thank you for your commitment to teaching, to music, to the arts, to our schools, and to our students. So as I promised, I'd love for y'all to come on up so we can get another photo of you and celebrate you for your excellence. Thank you.
sit at my table a few years ago for CMA. You did. Right? Yeah, with, with Dr. Wade. Yes! 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 I would just love to shout out NSA. They had a performance just a few weeks ago, and I took my four-year-old son, and he paid attention the entire time and actually started singing to me in the car. So thank you, Trey. <laughs> thank you for that. But really, it was, it was beautiful. I appreciate it. On that note, we really appreciate everybody being here tonight. We know that takes up time and the, the after hours, but we're so happy to celebrate you. Um, it's very nice to always know that we're being recognized and our teachers are being recognized and our students are being recognized. So it's really exciting to have both, both Coach Patton and, of course, our mental health uh, experts and those that are organizing it and, of course, our music teachers. I'm so excited to see um, our music teachers being recognized. Um, and there's a focus on that. So as you may remember, the adoption of the agenda, we moved uh, item number two to before the director's report. In case we want to move the agenda up. Item number two is the resolution to celebrate Hispanic Heritage Month, honoring Virginia Poopa Walker as the first Hispanic person elected to the Metropolitan National Board of Education. And I will pass this over to my colleague, Vice Chair, here. Um, I make a motion to approve the resolution. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> um, resolution to celebrate off. to celebrate Hispanic Heritage Month honoring Virginia Poopoo Walker as the first Hispanic person to be elected to the Metropolitan Nashville Board of Education. Whereas Virginia Poopoo Walker was born and raised in Nashville, Tennessee, is a proud graduate of Metropolitan Nashville Public Schools, the daughter of a Cuban immigrant and, and a rural Tennessee native, Mrs. Poopoo Walker is a wife and mother of two children who also graduated from Metropolitan Nashville Public Schools. Whereas Virginia Poopoo Walker has worked in education for over two decades, she was a Spanish teacher and a history, a Spanish and history teacher in metro, in metro Public Schools. Her career evolved into community and family engagement to ensure her community um, had access to the best educational resources available. As Mrs. Poopoo Walker's career progressed, she became a statewide leader in the nonprofit sector, advocating for Latino and Hispanic communities in education. Whereas in 2018, Virginia Poopoo Walker was elected as the first Latina to be elected to the Metropolitan School Metropolitan Nashville School School Board. Uh, school Board member Poopoo Walker's election reflected the demographics of the Hispanic and Latino community. Latino student community of Nashville Public Schools as we affirm diversity is one of our district's greatest strengths. Therefore, let it be resolved as we, as we celebrate Hispanic Heritage Month, we recognize and honor the election and the tenure of school board member Virginia Poopoo Walker as the first Hispanic to be elected to the Metropolitan Nashville Schools Board of Education. We commemorate her contributions to Hispanic and Latino communities with her advocacy in education. Thank you. All right. May we please have a vote? If you are all in favor of this resolu resolution, <laughs> please raise your hand. Thank you. It is all unanimous. I appreciate that. Thank you. If we, if we may have our... our past colleague, Ms. Poopa Walker, come up for a photo with Ms. Player Peters mm -hmm. and me. Everybody that would be lovely. I would say the board may join as well. Yes, to everybody. Yes. <laughs> I mean, I'll take you to myself. Yes. Um, yes, you're welcome to. I'm so sorry, Dr. Battle. I appreciate you checking in. You're welcome. <laughs> 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 Thank you, everybody. Thank you. 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 Thank you.
We appreciate our some of our past colleague, Ms. Puka Walker, being here. Um, I am proud to serve on a board that honors the diversity of not only our staff, but our student population, but also within our own colleagues. I think it's really important that we represent the public that we represent. And so I appreciate that we were able to honor her, especially um, in honor of Hispanic, Hispanic Heritage Month. Um, and I know that that is important to particularly uh, Ms. Player and I's uh, districts, as we have probably the highest population within Nashville. So thank you so much for your work as a colleague, but also continuously. So we appreciate that. Thank you. All right. Um, we will move on to the director's report. All right. Thank you again, um, Chair Erwatt, um and board members. Um, I hope everyone had an excellent and restful um, fall break, um, but it's good to be back um, with everyone. Um, before I jump in, I do want to acknowledge um, all of our friends and colleagues in St. Louis, Missouri. Um, again, another um, devastating um, occurrence, and again, our hearts, prayers, thoughts um, go out to them as um, they continue to do what's best for their um, students and families and their staff, um, creating the right conditions and safety, but at the core of everything we do, educating all of our students. And so just wanted to acknowledge um, our, our friends and colleagues and families um, in St. Louis. I also want to um, acknowledge um, two of our um, great partners who are here with us um, this evening, Commander Scott Bird and Lieutenant Jason Picanza uh, from MMPD School Safety Division. Uh, we appreciate you all's continuous partnership, um, just your innovation and push to do what's right and best here in Metro National Public Schools and in Nashville in general. So thank you um, for your leadership and um, for your commitment um, to our kids, our families, and our staff. Greatly appreciate you. So before we get into the assessment update, um, I wanted to give a quick um, note from the world of MPS athletics. Things just keep getting sweeter and sweeter uh, with our student athletes. So Hume Falk sophomore Rachel Waters recently proved without a doubt that she is one of the best golfers in Tennessee. Rachel not only qualified for the TSSAA Golf State Championship Tournament in Sevierville, she also was near the top of the leaderboard for the entire first round shooting a blistering two over par 72. I think I know what that means. <laughs> <laughs> And according to observers on the course, she hit a remarkable 16 greens in regulation during the first round, a feat that is rarely matched on even a professional tour. So congratulations to Rachel, and thank you for representing Metro Schools so well. I also wanted to recognize the Hillsboro High girls volleyball team led by coach Sarah Rucker, who finished fourth in the TSSAA championship after defeating Lebanon and Maryville High Schools. Please note that this was the first time in the state tournament since 1982. So congratulations to all of these fierce competitors for their great achievements, um, the student athletes, the coaches, the parents, the staff, um, who all cheered them on and rallied them to their fourth place finish. So let's give Rachel and Hillsboro's girls volleyball team a round of applause. So the purpose of um, the director's update tonight um, is to provide an overview of how we selected our new assessment system. You've heard lots about this um, over the last um, few mo months um, and the intentionality around our assessment system. Also to provide a snapshot of the data the new system provides and how we plan to use it. Um, and thirdly, to provide the data that the board is accustomed to seeing generated from the new system itself. Um, so I would like to invite up um, 
Dr. David Williams, um, who is our executive officer um, leading our teaching and learning um, team, and also um, Dr. Tina Stinson will be joining him um, in this presentation, and Tina serves as our executive director of our um, research, assessment, and evaluation team. So thank you both for your leadership and for um, helping us really dig into this assessment update today. Well, thank you. Um, this is on. I get to follow all the recognitions and celebrations with assessment update. Um, so thank you. Um, we'll nerd out with you. Right, thank you. I, I appreciate that. We're, we're going to a little bit. Um, so good evening, uh, Chair O'Rod, Dr. Battle, members of the board. I'm pleased to uh, provide an update on our assessment system alongside uh, my colleague here, Dr. Tina Simpson, Executive Director of Research Assessment and Evaluation. As usual, we view our work through our core tenets, focused outcomes, and signature initiatives. Uh, so with regard to academic assessment specifically, that screen is... We want to empower leaders at all levels to make decisions based on data, to make a positive difference for kids, and then equipped with meaningful and actionable information about student learning, teachers are then able to create engaging, rigorous, and personalized learning experiences for each student. I want to ground us in the MMPS assessment vision and belief statements. First, assessment should form a coherent system providing academic data along the continuum of student learning while minimizing or eliminating redundancies. Next, assessment should be administered timely and purposefully across the school year and with consideration for all critical instructional activities and classroom assessments given. Finally, the information generated should be meaningful, actionable, and provided in time to make a positive difference. In short, assessments are about learning, identifying where students are in their learning and what decisions can be made and actions that can be taken to um, improve outcomes. I want to quickly sketch where we have been with regard to district assessments over the last few years. Some of this will look familiar to you going back to 2016. <clears throat> Primarily, MMPS has utilized NWEA's MAP growth assessments for literacy and math. And we've also utilized FastBridge for academic screening. MAP is an adaptive, norm-referenced, standards-based assessment. Adaptive means the assessment responds to student responses. As students get questions correct, the assessment gets progressively more difficult and vice versa. Norm-referenced means that the results are compared to other students taking this assessment across the country. Standards-based means that the questions are written to assess, to assess competencies on a prescribed set of knowledge or understandings. FastBridge is a skills-based measure, but it is also norm-referenced. A skills-based measure aims to assess student ability on skills that are necessary and required for students to better access grade-level standards. A few strengths on the left of the screen, if you can see that, of our previous system was that MAP provides a strong, stable growth measure of student learning across time. Since it is adaptive, it is able to uh, precisely zero in on student ability. Data generated gave recommendations to teachers about content students were ready for or uh, what additional supports may be needed before students are ready to progress into new content. Alongside MAP, our screening process was already in compliance with FastBridge with state administration and reporting requirements. There were some limitations and challenges as well. Because MAP is a norm-referenced assessment, we had very limited information about student performance with respect, with respect to grade-level state standards against our scope and sequence. There were some features of MAP that were not being fully utilized, and there were also features of FastBridge that were not being fully utilized. Um, and so that created some redundancies because a lot of the different parts of the assessments performed the same um, measure. There were inefficiencies in our assessment approach because we are using two nationally normed measures which needed to be administered within certain windows to maintain their validity. A fourth grade student, for example, would take FastBridge for screening and MAP right at the very beginning of the school year. Working across two systems meant that staff were working across two different platforms for both administration and reporting. And finally, there was an emphasis in our district on how our students performed against a normed sample of students across the country instead of against grade level state standards. In anticipation of the contracts for both MAP and uh, FastBridge set, uh, set to expire at the end of last school year, we begin the plans for the RFP early last school year and release the RFP in October of 2021. Our goals here on the screen uh, were to more closely align with our assessment vision and belief statements and address some of the limitations and challenges of our previous system. 
We sought a more coherent system to assess both skills and standards. We wanted more actionable data to move students forward in their learning. And we also wanted to balance our assessments across the year and strengthen and streamline our screening process. On the left side, you can see data and information we have with our previous system, but I think I've kind of talked enough about that. Uh, so I'll focus on the right side of the screen here, focusing on what we have in place for this year. Both FastBridge and DNA are components from a single vendor that gets at the uh, more coherent experience for our school uh, staff and students. FastBridge continues to be our universal screening assessment for grades K through nine. Because we use their adaptive measures as part of our universal screening, we have unlocked what's called a screening to intervention report, not previously available. It's generated by the platform and makes recommendations for interventions, uh, progress monitoring for students who need intervention, as well as recommendations for small group and whole group instruction. DNA is the platform for our standards-based benchmark assessment. These are given in all TCAP tested grades and subject areas. So now we have assessments in science and biology, as well as all of our tested high school courses. So at a glance, this slide recaps all the information shared up to this point regarding our new assessment uh, system this year. Assessments one and two, you can see there, those form uh, the basis of our universal uh, academic and dyslexia screening process. You have a skills-based screener. Um, with FastBridge, we also have our growth measure, that's our adaptive reading and A, uh, A reading and A math, which are adaptive reading and adaptive growth measures. Those are based on standards, and those two taken together form our screening process. And then uh, assessment number three on the screen is our achievement measure, and that is again based on standards aligned to our state standards uh, according to our scope and sequence. It may help as, you, as we go through the presentation to think about what questions these assessments intend to answer. The first uh, uh, assessment, the screener, attempts to answer the question, where is additional supports needed and for whom? The second uh, assessment, a growth measure, attempts to answer the question, how are we doing? Where are we making progress? And then finally, the third question, the achievement measure, attempts to answer the question, are we getting there? I will now turn things over to Dr. Stinson. Good evening, everybody. Before going into the data themselves, I wanted to provide a brief summary of what you will see on the next slide, just to help ground, um, ground you. Um, Dr. Williams talked about the MTSS fall assessments, which are our fast bridge um, assessments. The assessment window was August 10th through September 1st. We did have over 90... Move your oh, mic over a little bit. Yes, I'm sorry. Um, we did have over 95% participation rate, which was really good. Um, and uh, more than 36,000 students grades two through nine attempted the um, adaptive nationally normed um, fast bridge reading and math assessments that Dr. Williams mentioned. Um, District reading and math scores were comparable, very similar in scores in our lower grades, um, but we um, had more students or a greater percentage of students um, scoring well on math than reading, which is the opposite of what we used to see on map. Um, and we'll delve into a little bit of, of why. There are some, um, there's some good news in the data. Um, and while the percentage of students in the lowest national quintile for uh, math and reading increased in fall of 2021, last year, during the pandemic, um, there were improvements in that in math for fall 2022. Um, and in addition, the percentage of students scoring in the top two quintiles in reading also improved from fall 21 to 22. Um, and that's um, particularly good um, because of some of the ways uh, we've changed the administration that I'll get into in another slide. Um, also, um, as has been the case um, for years and is true across the state and the country, we, we do see some achievement gaps between our student groups that we are working very hard to improve upon. Um, okay, so this chart may look familiar to you. It's very similar to the ones that Dr. Changis used to um, give to you, but 
because we have some new board members um, and because it's probably been a while, I'm going to just start with quickly, what is a quintile? Um, a quintile takes the distribution of scores across the nation. There's um, a norming studies with large numbers of students and puts the first to 20th percentile students in the first quintile up to the 80th to 99th percentile in the top quintile. So what we are looking at in this slide um, is where do our students fit relative to those national quintiles? You can see the national average line um, across um, that 20%. So 20% in each group is um, what we would see nationally. Um, so uh, what I mentioned before, um, even though um, we're using two different assessments and we really don't want to, com they're not comparable because they were normed differently at different times, et cetera, et cetera, you know, we still took a, um, a brief look at how we did last year versus this year. This is very similar distribution to what we saw in fall 2021 for MAP. However, the good news is with MAP, we had students using accommodations like read aloud um, and whatever they have in their IEP. Because FastBridge is being used as a screener, that is not an appropriate thing to do. So now we're, we're, we're comparing that apple to this orange and are still doing you know, roughly the same. So doing roughly the same without accommodations is really good news. Um, uh, so um, there was a small, very small increase, um, less than a percent, about half a percent in the number of students falling in this lowest quintile um, between MAP last year and um, uh, fast this year. However, those top two percentiles, uh, top two quintiles, we do have a greater number of students in those um, top two. And again, without accommodations and with accommodations are very different things. Bridge A math quintiles. Again, um, we don't really want to get into what it was like last year, but we are seeing some improvements in the number, um, per, rather the percentage of students in that bottom quintile. The bottom quintile for us really is just telling us that these students may need interventions. They may because there is also the standards-based data that schools and uh, teachers should be looking at and all the rest of the suite of FAST assessments as well as what teachers know about the students they teach. Um, the, and we did that with um, the top two quintiles stayed about the same. When we're talking about the impact of the accommodations, uh, depending on reading or math, we had about 23% of our students using those accommodations. But that meant that we could not really tell where our students needed help, right? And so that we're scoring very similarly uh, is very good news. I'm gonna change um, chart type for a second, uh, even though the data are drawn from the same place. Um, remember I said the percentiles fall into one of five quintiles. In this case, on this chart, the median national percentile first per student group is what is being shown. So um, we use the median, which is basically just the number, you know, the, the percentile um, below which um, half of our students, uh, half of national students fall, right? So the national average would be 50 for all students across the nation. It would, you know, um, and each uh, student group might have its own national um, median. However, you can't average percentiles, so we use the median, but it's, it's roughly similar in concept. So you can see, I'm not going to go through every single one of these numbers, but you can see um, where we have some gaps. They, they are largely similar to what we saw last year. 
with the exception of the students with disabilities and non-students with disabilities and English learners and not EL students. The reason being the accommodation. And again, there's, uh, you know, the state has strongly recommended that we not use accommodations on a screener. It's not a good practice. So um, the benchmarks, however, do have um, accommodations. So there is a place where we can ga gauge how students are doing with their accommodations. MNPS A Math Achievement by Student Group. Um, Overall, again, we did um, a tiny bit better with, with math than ELA. Um, and you can see, again, the gaps. They, 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 um, they fall where we would expect, uh, you know, um, these to be. Um, however, um, some of the gaps are smaller in math than they are in reading. and. Um, that concludes this portion of the um, presentation. However, I do want to say what we're going to look forward to in the future. As Dr. Williams said, and I said at the beginning of the presentation, um, these data we are primarily using to track student growth. So regardless of where an absolute number is at this moment in time, the primary reason we are showing this to you is so that that in you know in spring or you know late winter we can show you how our students are growing much in the same way that you used to see dr. Williams all right thank you so uh, miss Claire you said we we're gonna geek out is that what you said okay so we'll see how we do. Um, before I go through some key takeaways with respect to the benchmark administration, I want to provide a little bit of context. <clears throat> we do have information across all of our tested subjects uh, and grade levels. Uh, but for tonight, I just want to illustrate some high level analysis from grades three and seven. Uh, so I did, just to review, the benchmark was administered in grades three through eight for ELA math and science. Um, social studies would have been added in grades six through eight. In high school, we have integrated math one, two, three, English one and two, biology and U.S. history. And th those were the, the grade levels and content areas that, that would have taken our benchmark assessments. I also want to point out that I will be sharing some raw um, data points as percentages, but that's just for relative comparison about where students saw success and where they saw challenge. It's not correlated to a grade level. We can't make any judgments about is this good or bad. It's just we can see where did our students seem to struggle the most and where did they, they find the most success. And also, um, we just finished our window, makeup window, last Friday. And so uh, the, the vendor and uh, RAE, uh, with, led by Dr. Stinson, will be doing some analysis to correlate those to TN Ready and TCAP. Just not ready yet because that process is just, uh, just getting started. So I'm going to start with third grade math um, and look at for some general trends and then some content uh, trends. In third grade, our students found the most success with calculator item types and multiple choice, traditional multiple choice item where you have four uh, answer choices and you pick the, the correct one. Students generally struggled with uh, more with non-traditional items and also with non-calculator items. Uh, for the first time now with our benchmark, one thing that's really exciting is we have content-specific data aligned to our grade level standards that we can look at and we can see that students were most successful demonstrating their understanding of representations of area as a sum of n non-overlapping uh, unit squares, which is fantastic. Um, students did struggle with multiplying and dividing. Those are new arithmetic operations in third grade uh, within 100 to solve word problems. In third grade ELA, uh, what we start to see is that the passage matters. So there's one passage called jellyfish, where students were asked to determine the meaning of unfamiliar words or phrases, uh, and also distinguish literal from non-literal or figurative language, while another passage asked students to rewrite sentences for clarity and grammatical correctness. You can see how students perform with respect to the questions on each of the passages. 45.8% of students scored correctly on jellyfish, 40.2 uh, on throat singers. I'd also point out that jellyfish was aligned to our wit and wisdom module, so they're studying sea animals and creatures of the sea. Uh, so we try to extend that topic and theme all the way through the benchmark so students uh, felt like an extension of, of their learning in the classroom. 
In science, we also see students were typically more successful with multiple choice items, but struggled with more of the non-traditional item types. And just quickly, non-traditional uh, typically means maybe a multi-select, where there may be five answer choices, and students are asked to pick the two that are correct or the three that are correct. And so that's fundamentally a different cognitive process than the multiple choice where you're picking the one correct answer. Again, we see content matters. Uh, students were more successful recognizing that energy, kinetic energy, is present when objects move, but struggled to describe the phases of matter, like solids, liquids, and gases. Seventh grade math, my favorite. Uh, students were more successful with traditional item types and non-calculated items. So we see a pattern here with the item types. This, this actually cuts across all grades and content areas that I've uh, personally analyzed. Um, with, and, and also I'll point out that students tended to do better with non-calculator items in grades four through seven and struggled more with calculator items in grades four through seven. Uh, for content, students were successful identifying the constant of proportionality uh, or the unit rate in a proportional relationship but struggled to represent that proportional relationship when they were presented one with maybe a table or graph and had to create the equation uh, that associated those varying quantities. In ELA, students again tended to struggle. You can see this pattern uh, continue. Uh, for content, students were again more successful using context clues to identify the meaning of an unfamiliar word or phrase, but struggled with the passage where they had to identify the theme or central idea. And in this case, there were two texts presented because now we're in seventh grade and looking at uh, two texts together as a single passage and maybe doing some analysis uh, can be a little bit more complex for, for our older students. In seventh grade science, students scored better on recall questions. But again, you can see the pattern of struggling uh, with different item types. With respect to content, um, students perform better with models illustrating the atomic structure, so understanding where a neutron, proton, electrons are and their relative uh, charges. Uh, but they also struggled to use the periodic chart to understand the nature of the elements uh, under analysis. In social studies, again, we see a familiar pattern of item types. Uh, we did see a lot, a lot of success when students were presented a map and had to identify countries that were labeled. Uh, they were most successful identifying countries on a map of East Asia in particular, uh, but struggled to understand how empires evolve in uh, ancient Europe and how languages and religions spread. So some overall benchmark takeaways. Let me get my notes here. First, uh, students need the opportunity to practice non-multiple choice items. So I want to be clear that we want to respond and not react and certainly not overreact. But uh, we think it's incumbent upon us to give our students the best opportunity to demonstrate their knowledge um, and provide an even playing field so that if we have a state test and that's what our uh, district and our schools are held accountable to, we want to give our kids the best chance to be successful and be confident when they go into a test taking environment and demonstrate their knowledge. The student success varies by passes with ELA. So we know that there are different levels of complexity, different writing styles, uh, the nature of the topic that's being written about varies, of course. So we can go further and see, well, which particular items presented most challenge to our kids and what other supports do we need when we annotate and we analyze pieces of text. Uh, with regard to the calculator, what's important to understand is just because you have a calculator available on the test doesn't mean you have to use it. So understanding when it's most efficient and appropriate to use and where it's actually okay to ignore it because I may have a more efficient strategy that's a little more straightforward and not be distracted by the calculator. Um, I also want to clarify that teachers have access. I just did uh, some sample analysis uh, across the grade levels and content areas and share, share with you 3.7. Teachers have access to the same information. They can look at all the items. They have the same access to all the data and reports that I've shared with respect to item types, uh, levels of depth of knowledge, the different passages, the standards. All of that is available to teachers uh, for all their students who participate in the assessment. So teachers now have content-specific information. And again, we didn't see the questions on MAP because it was adaptive, so every fifth grade student would have gotten a different test, depending on how they were doing, since it's adaptive, and teachers wouldn't have been able to see the questions um, or the standards that those particular questions were aligned to. But now we have, we're armed and equipped with that information. Uh, and again, teachers have access to all the items. So depending on how an item is presented, is it text heavy? Was there a graph? Was there a visual aid? Was there a model? Was there a map? Uh, what was it about the question that may have presented challenges so we can think about incorporating uh, supports into our instruction as we move forward? 
So next steps. Again, schools have, as Dr. Simpson uh, noted, we have all of our benchmark data that I just went through, our A reading and A math growth data, uh, as well as the other uh, assessment pieces of our fast bridge screening for progress monitoring in the, in the data warehouse. And again, it's in a coherent platform with the Illuminate site. Uh, we're working towards making sure that uh, teachers, uh, sorry, students and families have access to this data that's in a, in a meaningful and useful way uh, and put that on the personalized student dashboard. As I mentioned earlier, we're looking at making these statistical correlations to T and Ready to make projections about where students are expected to perform um, at the end of the year, but also having this information allows us to intervene positively and alter that trajectory uh, in a positive way. And we're also providing professional developments and supports with coaches, with our principals, uh, Larry Miles and I data uh, uh, district assessment, I'm sorry, district data coordinators, so they get that right, uh, led a session with principals on October 7th. We're providing protocols, uh, making sure that, that uh, all school staff understand how to access and appropriately use these, these supports, uh, these reports. So with that, Dr. Battle, I'm going to turn it back over to you. Um, thank you so much, um, Dr. Williams, um, Dr. Stinson, um, for leading us to this director's report, and certainly to um, Dr. Um, Mason Bellamy, who leads the um, entire division of schools and academics. Um, so with that, um, that will conclude the director's update, and Chair, I'll turn it back over to you. Thank you. Do any of my colleagues have questions? I will start with Ms. Tyler and then... My first question is, do the tests, are, are they kind of, do they compare to where the students should be? Are they timed to coincide with information that should have already been presented? Or will students be expected to answer questions that they maybe haven't learned about yet that will come later in the semester? Are you referring to the benchmark assessments? Yes. Specifically, so we've intentionally aligned those to only content and standards that were taught in the first quarter for okay. all of our grades and content areas. As we move forward, that will also be true quarter two, quarter three. Okay, thank you. Oh, and before we move on, I just want to say I, I'm really glad to see that teachers have access to all the items of knowing exactly what their students were struggling with, where they had successes. That information, as you said, has not previously been available, and that has really caused issues about whether or not the test is actually helpful. And having that information at a teacher's fingertips provides something that's actually helpful that can inform their instruction. So that's what a test is supposed to do. And Ms. Tyler, if I can just mention, I mean, the most consistent feedback that I've personally received about um, the new suite of assessments is access to the reports and, and the data. That is by far the number one <laughs> um, piece of feedback that we have um, received. So thank you for um, acknowledging that and certainly to the team for uh, pushing for advocating, kind of designing um, our system in that way. And before we move on to the next question, I also want to give a thank you to uh, Renita Perry, who also leads our Schools of Innovation um, and the team that just works so well um, in this space. Thank you. I have a really simple question, uh, at least I'm assuming it's simple. Can you give me some examples of what your non-traditional math items are? Yes, certainly. Uh, great question. Um, generally, in the lower grades, you will see a question that is it's, it's referred to as a multiple select or multi-select item. Um, and so it could say, uh, could be a question of something like, which are all directions on a compass? And you would have north, table, south, chair, microphone. Well, two of the answers are correct. Right, the, the north and the south that I mentioned, the other three are incorrect. So in order for our students to get that question correct, they have to select both correct answers to get that question correct. If they um, get one of one in part, and in other words, if they selected north and chair, they would get that answer, that question wrong. So they have to correct, select all the correct ones and only the correct ones. The, the questions get a little more sophisticated as you get into older grades uh, with the technology enhanced items is what they're referred to. And they'll get into like drag and drop. You have a little drop down uh, so to select the answer choices, maybe drag and drop to fill in the blanks of certain sentences. Uh, so you may have a word bank in the bottom and I have to drag the right phrase or word into the correct place in the paragraph. So they can get a little more complicated Complicated, but those are examples of non-traditional items. A traditional item would just be your multiple choice, four questions, and four answers, and you pick the right one. Okay, so they're, they're generally word problems? Um, could, could range. It could be okay. those item types could, be, could assess any, any type of knowledge. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Okay, I, 
I want warning. I have several questions. Um, so thanks in advance. Um, so first, as a parent, I, you know, had gotten really used to MAP, and I knew what to look for. Um, you know, especially thinking about RIT score and growth percentage, and sort of the where my kids fall, national norm, et cetera. Do you all have a sense of what parents? We'll see when they get. Uh, uh, so I, I understand that um, the data will be put into the portal, which is great. Um, and I just checked, and I haven't seen mine yet, but that doesn't mean it's not there, um, or won't be soon. But will I, as a parent, get a report? What does the report look like? You know, do I have? Will I get those kinds of same numbers so I know what to be thinking I want for my kid? Uh, yes, we are actually actively in discussion about which data elements to place in there that will make and how to make sense uh, of those data. So I don't have an exact answer for you yet, other than that they will be there, um, because you can score really well in one thing and not really well in others, and that may not be alarming to a teacher. But it would be to a parent. Right. <laughs> so active discussion. <laughs> yeah. Um, if, if I can advocate at all for something that, that shows a, sort of a growth goal, if that's the type of thing that's possible, I know that that's something that I do hear parents actually sort of tag on to and discuss. I don't know if that is possible. We um, will certainly discuss that. Um, speaking of, that's sort of, I, so when we see this information again, we will see something relative to growth. What, what kinds of things should we expect to see relative to growth um, if we're sort of, again, used to doing that, like, growth percentile type calculation? So um, we are going to be using the A reading and A math and looking to see if a student's percentile remained the same or improved from test A to test B and from test A to C. Um, and that's very, very similar to what you would have gotten from MAP. Um, and I apologize if I should be directing these questions to you, Dr. Bottle, instead. I think that's probably how I was supposed to do it. <laughs> so, sorry, I jumped right in. Um, if you, if we, you, you mentioned, Dr. Stinson, that um, you're doing some comparison, not really wanting to, with FAST last year and, and MAP this year. Have you all looked at all at MAP, I'm sorry, at FAST last year to FAST this year? And do we have a sense year, of that? This year. Um, we are looking at that at a high level, but uh, as I mentioned earlier, um, we weren't fully utilizing all the assessments in FastBridge. We weren't using the adaptive measures last year, and so now we are. So if you, even if you're looking at an aggregate, you, it's a little bit of a different comparison. What we could do is look at only the discrete uh, assessments, which are limited because some of the, the assessment probes are just a few minutes. Uh, Curriculum-based measure is really, really quick. So um, we could do that, but it would be, again, with heavy right. caveats. Yeah. Yes. Um, okay, so I just have one last question. Um, um, so I'm, I'm curious about the um, middle school math results being, um, I think Dr. Sensen, you pointed out, higher than reading, which uh, my sense is that that's not, that that's inconsistent with some of the other data that we've seen. And do you all have any thoughts about that? Go ahead, go ahead Tina. Thank you. Um, yes, we do have some thoughts about that, and we will be exploring it further, but um, we are pretty certain that the um, the accommodations issue explains all, like almost all of that difference. Um, because if you are, say, an English learner, it's easier for you to access the math content on a reading and a math. A reading and a math, right? A, the benchmarks have the accommodations. Got it. Great. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. There. So I have a couple questions, and I don't know if these are relevant or not, so please correct me if I'm wrong, but just from a community aspect, how does the assessment prepare or, um, I guess, benchmark how students prep for the ACT and SAT? Is it relevant? Is it completely not relevant? Is it only just for academic measurement and has nothing to do with one or the other? 
Now, that, that is a great question. Um, we were actually in a conversation about that today. Um, and we were talking about the trajectory between elementary, middle, and high. Then we look at ACT as an 11th grade assessment. It's not a high school assessment. It's really the totality of their experiences across the grades. And so all of our teachers, elementary, middle, and high, have uh, an interest in preparing students for that ACT. And the best thing that elementary teachers can do to prepare students for the ACT in 11th grade is teach, teach their content well, right? Teach their students well. Um, um, and, and Dr. Sinsen could also probably talk more about this, but we do have strong TVOS projections uh, from how our students performed on our achievement test uh, correlated very strongly to ACT. So if we're thinking about the best way to prepare kids for ACT is to teach our state standards well and, and teach our kids well, of course. Okay. Um, and then how does the assessment measure, I guess, the narrative learning loss from the pandemic? Like, does... Does it, I guess, how to respond to that when people in the community ask, how do you measure learning loss? Has there been learning loss? And how do we assess that, I guess, now since we're kind of now a full academic year outside the academic Yeah, the that's pandemic. a great question. Um, uh, we prefer to use the term acceleration, term acceleration and also unfinished learning. So if a student's uh, growth in their academic progress was stunted by, disrupted by the pandemic, we call that unfinished learning. And so uh, what these assessments do is, again, allow us to track screening where kids need additional supports, growth, how are they progressing and making progress from one administration to the other. And with respect to the grade level standards, we have an op obligation to teach students those grade level standards, uh, regardless of their ability level or, or you know, what the, the growth percentile says. Um, and so what, what we're doing with this assessment system is we can look comprehensively at where students are and dial in very specifically what they need to move forward in their unfinished learning, if that's the case. Um, and we've built in uh, a lot of of additional supports for a lot of our scope and sequence. Our math, for, math scope and sequence, for example, has opportunities for, for teachers to go back and provide additional remediation to account for some of that unfinished learning <laughs> based on the data. Okay. And my last question, um, how do these overall test scores affect that we have a critical mass of students who are not proficient in English? So how is that affecting um, our average or our median um, aspect of, of the assessment? or the adaptive or the benchmark. We're trying to think about those differently just because the accommodation on the adaptive measure uh, is not allowed, mm -hmm. uh, but it is on the uh, benchmark. So I was just trying to clarify. Are you talking about just in general? Just in general. Like okay. In general, it's ever easier for you to answer or right. what's best for you to answer. Uh, so on the, the screening measure, again, accommodations are not allowed. We want to really be able to identify the, the skill areas that may need support. And if we had an accommodation, it may mask the very thing we're trying to identify. Um, and so... Um, those students who, who don't speak English natively may struggle on that. We do allow full accommodations. So when we're looking at IEP and what accommodations are going to be provided on TN Ready, we're trying to replicate that to the maximum extent possible. Um, so if that is uh, extended time, even though the benchmarks are not really a time test, if there's a text-to-speech accommodation that needed to be configured in the system, that's also done for students who need it. So ultimately, between the two assessments, you'll be able to assess what is the actual language barrier and then what is they need enrichment or support and learning more academic content. Yes. Okay. That's all I have. See, I nerded out with you. <laughs> Thank you. Erin, you got oh, your sorry. One more question, Phil, um, is just, and this, this may be um, a question for Dr. Battle, but how, what is the, um, I think, it, like, it's, it's awesome to have a, a test and a set of tests that are both testing different things, all of which we need to know about kids, and then also being able to give information back to, as you said, teachers and principals at a level that is pretty detailed on what students are learning. What's sort of the expectation for um, schools and teachers on how they're using this information instructionally? Dr. Bellamy, thank you. You for the question because really that's what it's all about, right? What, it's what we do with the data, what Dr. Um, Williams and, and Dr. Stenson were alluding to. So um, we immediately share some benchmark protocols with them. They go into the use the ILT structures or instructional leadership teams. Um, the majority of our schools will discuss this uh, grade level data, school level data, teacher level data within their ILT um, to discuss what they would need to attack. Um, 
as a whole. And then, of course, teachers within their small learning communities are going to be looking at their class data that way too. So the expectation is funneled down through the leadership side of the division of schools. The executive directors um, work with their principals <laughs> on those ILT agendas, looking at and supporting what, depending on where um, the ILT is in that journey themselves. And so talented people in the in RAE, I believe uh, Larry Miles was mentioned earlier. Um, Dr. Uh, Williams mentioned a PD he did with principals earlier to let them uh, get familiar with the robust data that was available, in particular in the DNA platform so that they could use the staff development days coming up um, and collaborative planning time that have been coming up since this um, to leverage their, their ILT structures that they've worked so hard to put in place over the last year to do that. I, I, the only other th thing I would, um, I guess, question, I have a question about our advocate for again, is just thinking about this as a parent who, like, I love assessment data for my kids. Um, I, I would love to know how to support that from the perspective of being a parent and helping to know and understand what it is that I should be advocating for with my own children at home and maybe with teachers, et cetera. I don't, I don't know what that looks like, but, um, but I know as you all get for, and I mean, these are new, right? So there's a lot. And step one is get it right with teachers and, and principals because they're the experts, but um, uh, whatever can be done to help parents understand well what this all means and what's to help do about it, I think would be excellent, and, and I'd be happy to. Yeah, and I pursue. think you know it, it's a new suite of assessments with clarity around why we do what we do, and what we're expecting to learn um, from the data. So we really kind of foundationally making sure that it's really, really strong. But we've learned a lot. I mean, we've there are reports that go home that are be, that are consistent. I believe the fast reports that go home are consistent f um, to what we've sent home in the past. We're kind of thinking through, making sure we're sending the right information home around our benchmark assessments. We know our parents have access to our personalized student dashboard. We'll continue um, to leverage that. And in the future, just like we did with MAP, we'll start having some of those sessions where we can dig in. But we we want to make sure that we're getting this right um, out of the gate and all the supports are there because we can send a lot home and a parent can ask a question if the team is not ready to respond to it because they've not had an opportunity to get in there, dig into it, and understand it. Um, we just want to guard against that, just making sure we're prepared and ready to go. But we will share the information and we will continue to communicate out and a supportive, um, user-friendly way to make sure that we are all building kind of a knowledge bank of what our suite of assessments mean um, and how we plan to respond. Um, David and I, if you don't mind me sharing, we were just having a conversation yesterday about getting really good at this and making sure that like really individualized reports at some point that speak to here's what's next for your student. All right, here's the data, but here's what you can be doing at home. Here's what we're working on at school. Um, that takes time. Time to, to build out, and we've got to automate that to some degree, um, but we have a big vision around the collective effort and support around our assessments and what we need um, to know about our students to support them yep. fully. Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. I just want to say to Dr. Battle and to Dr. Williams and Dr. Stinson, like just thank you for kind of, I, it's been frustrating with the pandemic that we had to deal with the pandemic that we haven't been proactive as we want to be, I would say, um, into really getting into, into steps to really start doing assessments of what we want to and to be able to see what's best and how to really kind of do that. I know we've had not moved as fast as we want to, but now that we've kind of gotten back to the new normal, to see that we're back on track on that, I just, I just appreciate that, that I know it hasn't been easy trying to figure out going from virtual learning to synchronous and asynchronous and doing everything now that we're starting to really get to the direction or start that journey, what we really want to get down to. So I just want to at least recognize this moment in time where um, I know the community has been frustrated or we personally have been frustrated because we've had to divert our time and issues to health health reasons and health issues and situations that we'd be able to really focus on the academics as, as deeply and as passionately as we want to. So I just want to just take a moment and just mark, mark this moment for that. Thank you. I have, <clears throat> excuse me, I have a couple questions um, and I guess a statement as well. Uh, first, I would like to say that I really appreciate 
um, that there is the summary of the assessment results. I think that's really very helpful for not only us as a board, but also for the audience that's watching. Um, and so I really appreciate that being added. Dr. Stinton um, also giving us the definition of what is a quintile because that is also helpful. Again, not just for us, but for everybody that is ideally, hopefully watching. So on that note, can we get a definition of what is ILT? <laughs> ILT is an instructional leadership team, um, and uh, that's something that the Division of Schools has been uh, instituting over the last year, as Dr. Bellamy said, at their schools. It's comprised largely, of course, of the principal, administrators, uh, key staff, teachers, um, uh, deans, coaches, etc. cetera. Um, and so they, they meet regularly to review school-wide data, look for trends, support teachers, and support the growth of their students uh, with regard to whatever it is. It could be attendance, it could be behavior, it could be academics. Um, the ILT group that's reviewing it, and if, or, which of course is by grade band, and depending on how that school is organized, but also our individual teachers, when they're reviewing this information, which I am also very glad that it's available to them, as I know that's been a, a key issue and concern for not just teachers, but also us and just the theory of what is the reason for assessments. Um, when they provide that information, I know it was key that we said that we want the data to be usable, and I know we're working on how that data is going to be presented. Do we have an idea of what we think that will look like besides, I know many of us are interested in what assessment data is and we can easily discern that, but do we have an idea of what that will look like <clears throat> and how it will be provided to them? Um, uh, yes, we've, I think, spent hours on top of hours on top of hours talking about this most recently because, like you said, we can have all this information, but how we communicate it, um, what our expectations are around it, I mean, it all, it all matters. And this was the whole point of the redesign of the um, suite of um, assessments. And so, um, David, you do a really good job of communicating why, like, what we're trying to pull from each assessment. Could you, do you mind providing that overview for the board? Yes, ma'am. Uh, the the Screening, uh, again, that's part of FastBridge. Uh, it's a universal screening for academic and dyslexia uh, skill areas, and we want to know which students need more support and in what specific areas. And the screening is intended to help us pinpoint identify specifically uh, what skill areas or skill deficits uh, may need to be addressed. Um, those skills are important because without some of those critical foundational skills, students may struggle in their Tier 1 class to identify the to uh, access the core standards in their Tier 1 instruction. And so uh, students who, who's receiving intervention is getting those skill gaps remediated so that they can better access the grade level standards in the classroom with their peers. The adaptive measures, A reading and A math, attempt to answer the question, how are we progressing and are, and are students growing? Um, and because it's nationally normed, we can sort of see with those quintiles and some of the, the median national percentile comparisons to see are our students progressing and making growth over time. The benchmark, though, represents a, just a one-time achievement measure to see are our kids getting there? Are they meeting the standards that are outlined by the State Department? So those three, those three different questions, uh, what supports are needed, are we growing, are we progressing, and are we getting where we intend to go with respect to our standards? Those are three questions, and our assessment system can, can uh, strongly answer all three of those questions. Is, do we have a... Parent-teacher conferences are on Friday. Um, within those conferences, do we have a standardized way that any of this information will be presented, or do, will we going forward? That's something that, that we actually talked about again today. We need, it, we need to have uh, a, a standardized way uh, that we talk about the information. We don't have that just yet, uh, given our, our, the newness of our system. Um, but we have shared, again, protocols and uh, the reports, how to access the reports. There are family reports that are automatically generated. We think it could use probably some more framing cont and contextual language to help parents make under, uh, sense and understand exactly what this data represents. So that's something that we're definitely gonna, gonna work toward. I mean, I would love it if it's, of course, available to parents in a multitude of ways. Sure. Parent-teacher conferences, obviously, that's a tight timeline against this new assessment. But I think that's a good thing to, for us to shoot for, for us to be able to use it and model how that information is usable. Also, along with... <clears throat> how we are trying to see what at-home things uh, parents and students can do. I noticed that, sorry, I have so many different notes, excuse me. Um, for grade seven takeaways and grade seven, three takeaways in both science, it was it, just a little odd note that the non-traditional item types had the same 
percentage. They scored the same at 22.4% and 22.5%. So we're not noticing really an increase of they're not doing any better as they get to seventh grade on those specific questions. How do we uh, teach students to do better in those ways? How are we expecting teachers to accommodate that? Are we asking parents to do that? How are we planning on using that data and that interest? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. And again, um, we don't want to drill for test prep and, and test taking uh, processes, while at the same time balancing understanding the need that students have to, to be successful in demonstrating their knowledge. And so if I'm looking at um, the item report, this is how incredibly detailed this gets. If the correct answer choices were B, C, and D, I can see which three kids responded to. I can also see if they only selected one item, which means to me that they may not fundamentally be understanding that I have to select multiple correct items to get this one right. Uh, maybe they got two of the three correct. So it's important to think about the content intersecting with the item type and understanding what's interfering with the kid's ability to demonstrate uh, mastery of that particular in, in that response to that question. Uh, so having access to the items and knowing the standard and then looking at the reports and knowing how your kids responded really just empowers our teachers to think about going forward. Is it worth the time to take and think about how can I create a simple multi-select item so kids really understand when you see a question that looks like this, Think about what, what's required of you to answer it successfully. And, you know, kids being champions of their learning and, and, and you know, uh, strong scholars, empower them to apply that skill in the, in the uh, test setting uh, format. Um, but again, I think it's just a little bit of an idea of going over that. I think our teachers and our staff can certainly handle that. Again, not to drill it, uh, but it's a familiarity, and they need to create a sense of familiarity with those types of items. And, well, and it's that level of detail that will also empower um, the conversation conversations between um, the teacher and the parent, right? Because now we can be even more specific and detailed around exactly, um, you know, if it's a content, you know, concern, if it's a item type concern, you know, so that we, we can be even more specific around what's needed um, at home as we start to dig into those reports. And again, that's the feedback <laughs> I've been receiving already is like, wow, like I see so much. It covers so much around uh, where my students are, why they, it might not be a content issue. It, it, it could simply be that the I, they didn't understand the item type in front of them and then teaching them how to respond accordingly. And I must echo what David is saying. We're not here to teach a test. right? We are, we're educating kids. And so there's a fine balance between um, the two. And so we also want to make sure we're communicating that. We're training our staff on how to respond appropriately um, to this great data they now have at their fingertips. Absolutely. I <clears throat> want to be clear. I have absolutely no encouragement to be teaching to a test. Um, but it is a common phrase that I have heard all my life and still hear of I'm just not a good test taker. Um, my belief is that there are definite ways that some students struggle with test taking because they don't they have the fundamental understanding that we're talking about in this situation. So I'd rather them not take an assessment that's of no benefit to them if they needed just a simple scaffolding or something along those lessons. So um, I'm glad that that's being discussed in the ILT and other ways to try to make sure that's hit across the board so we can have that growth but also individually as students may need it. Um, I see there's a couple more questions, so I will go with Ms. Tyler and then our student board member. You had a question, yes? Uh, yeah. okay. um, so, again, like I've already said, I am extremely appreciative that our teachers will actually have access to the results of this. So my next question is, how much time are we giving them to go over these results? Um, are we expecting them to do this on their own time? Are we giving them um, a professional day where, where everybody gets to pour over the responses and ask questions of their team? How are we ensuring that they actually get to take the time to parse through the information? So different schools have addressed the immediacy of getting the results because you can literally get them as soon as you're done taking them, right? And so many teachers, obviously, um, like I'm sure you yourself did in the classroom, you jumped right in the second they were finished, right? We don't want them to have to do that, so we do encourage them to use um, already established planning time meetings to do that, and in, in particular, professional development days that we try to coincide. Now, obviously, our calendar's built years in advance, so the one coming up on November 8th would be a prime time to be able to do this, and we are encouraging many of our schools 
and their ILTs to do that. The ILT is oftentimes a situation where teachers are being paid a leadership stipend to participate because we want teacher voice on that committee, and that's in fact when ILTs are at their strongest. So we're encouraging ILTs. Uh, they do that inside sometimes the confines of their day through providing coverage for classes. Sometimes they meet after school, and again, that's a stipended position. It's handled a little bit differently everywhere. Um, but we would hope they would attach to existing structures and not create additional meetings for that, right? I mean, and again, we have those collaborative structures already very well embedded and hopefully to see lots of great use on the professional development day coming up on the 8th. Okay. Is it the 8th? Did I just give the wrong date? It's the 8th, yeah. isn't it? Okay, thank you. Um, and then I guess in the future, uh, could we... And I don't know how much control we have over when we're supposed to give it. If there's windows for this, the same way there used to be. For I don't know about that. Yeah. So this is this is excellent. I'm, I can give kudos to this team because um, we are creating um, even stronger alignment between what our general calendar looks like, uh, what those planning session planning days look like when we're coming together as teams to review data to um, kind of our testing window um, or assessment window, if you will. And so we have um, a great deal of that um, this year, but we've already accounted for and had discussions about that for um, the future as well, given the limitations we have, but we're, we're trying to um, get better alignment um, around when those cycles end and where they begin so we have time embedded uh, for review and adjustments to be made. Great. That was going to be my question, just ensuring that once you get the results, you don't have to wait two weeks to go over them, and there's not a parent-teacher conference in between when you're supposed to talk about them, but after you get the results. So just kind of that time frame, and I know you guys are on top of that, so it sounds like you've already thought about that and are planning for that moving forward, which I think is really important. Um, so, And then I guess the last thing is when we're talking about how to – address the issues where we see more supports that are needed um, for the students. Are we building that into just putting them in their different tiers, or are we changing some of the way the teachers are expected to um, present curriculum? How, how are we making sure that those needs are being met in a way that um, allows the teacher some autonomy to meet the needs that she knows he or she knows need to be met. Um, but I know because there's also still some some pretty strict guide rails around what you're supposed to be doing during a 90 minute time frame or, or this other for that. So how are we are we able to build that into the existing structure that we can address the issues um, and not say, well, I didn't get to do that section of it because I was addressing these issues, or I have to pick and choose between what I'm going to do, Does that, if that makes sense. David, do you want to take the question? Um, I can think of uh, two primary ways um, that I would do and, and did do in the classroom. Um, the first one is, um, as a teacher, when I'm starting my class, I usually had a warm-up or bell ringers on the board because I have to take attendance. I'm going to check homework. I'm going to make eye contact with every single kid that comes in my door. Um, and during that time, it's, it certainly makes sense within those first few minutes to continue Continue to provide content that they may have seen that challenged them or go over some of the item types that presented difficulty. You're not spending a lot of time. It's just the first few minutes. It's housekeeping. It's there, but I want to continue to build in that knowledge across the year. Um, the, the second thing I did um, was if I had content that I knew needed to carry through, my warm-ups in third quarter would still continue to <laughs> talk about the content that we've already learned that I need to keep spiraling back to. Uh, the second thing is I would take my assessments and I would tell my students, you're going to be be assessed on content that was in unit three, but also be prepared for content that you may have struggled with from unit one. So there's an opportunity to expand both our assessments and some of our remedial instruction. Uh, the third thing I can think of, though, is uh, depending on the assessment measure that I've, got, I've taken, if we're looking at the growth or the skills or the achievement, I want to respond most appropriately to what this, the, great, the, need, the greatest need is that has been identified. So certainly if I'm in intervention, um, that's, that's because the students had demonstrated some level of risk that I need to tend to uh, ensure up. And so then we would be providing appropriate instruction during that, that PLT. Thank you. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> excuse me, Elena, will you share your question and then we'll have Dr. Actually, I actually don't have a question. It's more of a comment. But um, I took the PSAT today. So this is, um, you know, I'm thinking about, you know, my experience in tests and what I feel like helped and didn't. And um, I 
personally, I don't think I've ever even taken the fast bridge, so I don't really know much about that. But the benchmark, I have taken, and I do think that in comparison to other tests we've taken, such as MAP, benchmark, it's it's a lot more familiar because they are aligned to the standards of each quarter. And so I think that test taking and just tests in general are very stressful and that's anxiety inducing for students. So when you take a test like MAP and it's adaptive and you're doing good, but you don't know you're doing good, you're getting hard questions. Like it's such a, <laughs> it's such a mind boggling thing. Versus a benchmark, it's a lot more comfortable because you're looking at something that you've been doing all year. So I, I definitely think the benchmark is, um, it's, it's good. Uh, also, though, I think that they're definitely, like when we talked about how third grade and seventh grade still weren't doing good with the non-traditional questions, I think that that is very significant because, you know, we're going to be taking tests for like the rest of our like school careers. So there should be some type, some level of growth there. And I think that, you know, learning to work with those non-traditional items as well as, you know, say, like, you know, the tests are timed. And I was like, it's not that I don't know the content. I don't have time to do all that. So just, you know, learning how to strategically, you know, take tests and not have, you don't need to use a calculator for everything. And I just feel like a lot of the times, a lot of things I hear after we take EOCs and things like that is, I wasn't ready and I didn't know or they didn't tell us that we were going to have to X, Y, and Z. And I feel like there has to be and like we said, not teaching to the test, but when we take the time and do it consistently throughout the year, it's not teaching to the test because you're not cramming in all of this prep and ACT prep, you know, six months before my test. It's like, you know, I totally should have been doing this last year. <laughs> so, you know, it's just things like that. I feel like there's, like we said, not teaching to the test, but there just there's a lot of strategies and things that have been proven to benefit students when taking tests. And I feel like we know, you know, as test takers and people who take tests, we know that, and a lot of students don't. And so I think that it's just important to go over a lot of the times um, just the basic do's and don'ts of tests and how to do it quickly and how to because, you know, like we said, the ACT and the SAT, those aren't, you know, those aren't measurements of you know, how smart the child truly is. It's, you know, it's, it really is, that's one of those things where it really is just to the test. And it's, and your score has nothing to do with you as a person. It's just how you know how to take the test. And a lot of students, um, in my experience, when we were taking the, what's it, true score? Some, some type of practice ACT thing. And, you know, a lot of people, they were just really like bummed out about their tests, but they were like, now that I've done it, I probably could do it again and do it a lot better. But when we don't have that exposure to a different type of testing material. I think that is where a lot of our struggles are because when we learn, and, and this could be great and perfect and effective teaching throughout the year, and every May, then we want to randomly say, hey, don't forget, do this, that, and the third. It's not, that, that it, it doesn't stick, it, and, and, and it's not effective. Um, yeah, that's my spiel. Also, um, you know, I'm hoping to see, of course, that we can, over time, you know, uh, decrease those achievement gaps, and I know that the district has a lot of plans for that, so I'm excited to see it. Yeah. Thank you for your student perspective, as always. <laughs> Dr. Nava McGee. Man, how can I top that? <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, a lot of my questions were asked um, throughout this, but I do I do um, want to acknowledge one thing and then ask a question to follow up that. Um, Dr. Williams, you had mentioned um, the you like to uh, uh, acknowledge it as unfinished learning uh, versus learning loss. Um, would you clarify why you would like to do it as unfinished learning versus learning loss, just for clarity? Um, I think I understand it, but I think it, it has become such a hot topic in a way. Um, and I think you know, not only us as board members really need to understand it, but the general public as well. 
Yeah, to me uh, personally, uh, learning loss implies that there's some sort of regression, that we got to a certain point and then we have gone backwards. And I haven't seen any data across any of our measures that indicate that we have regressed. We may have moved forward, albeit more slowly, but we are still moving forward. And so to say learning loss, again, implies regression, and we are certainly not regressing, nor will we. Um, instead, we're going to move forward. We need to continue to accelerate the pace at which we uh, move forward. But that's how it is seen with the difference, and that's why I'm really careful with those words. Thank you. Um, and, and I know the goal as the district is to make sure that we are closing the gaps in unfinished learning and accelerating learning where we can um, to help get students where we need them to be um, throughout the year. Um, with that being said, um, this is where differentiation and our, RT, our RTI model comes in. Can you talk a little bit, um, Dr. Battle, um, about, <laughs> sorry, um, so can you talk a little bit about um, how we're we're connecting um, th this new data with how we are adjusting or how we are differentiating our le learning within the classroom and how we are supporting the RTI model um, in that tiered learning process. You mentioned tier one, and I think I don't think a lot of people really understand um, what tier one is, but if you could talk a little bit about that as well. We absolutely can, Dr. Dr. Nabal, Nabal McKinney. <laughs> um, thank you for your question. Um, Dr. Williams, if you want to approach the podium. Um, yes, certainly. So um, the screening instrument that we talked about, the screening assessment, which is uh, our fast bridge suite of assessments, helps identify skill areas um, and students that might need a little bit more uh, supports and intervention. Um, those uh, interventions are typically provided in personalized learning time. So when we look at the, the data and we, we have what's, what's called an identified risk level, students at high risk, and that just means they're at high risk of falling behind their grade level peers uh, with respect to their sk these skills, uh, then we can provide very targeted and specific interventions to remediate those skills so that they don't stand in the way in students being able to access the standards. The standards are what are going to be taught in that tier one classroom. So we have tier one math, tier one English, for example. And if there are skills like um, simple calculations, like your multiplication facts, and if I have a word problem or I'm working with fractions, uh, maybe I'm scaling fractions, but I still struggle with those multiplication facts, I can't perform this other problem here very well, right? And so we want to continue to provide very skilled and targeted supports during our tier two and tier three intervention times, and that will also help students be more successful in tier one with the standards. Thank you. I just want some clarification because we're still using the word tiers. Um, can you describe what those different tiers look like? Um, so, for instance, tier one is general classroom, general population of students, and then tier two, tier three. Right. Um, according to the, the state's RTI manual, they, they indicate progressive levels of intensity. So, as you said, tier, tier one sometimes is called universal prevention. Every student is going to be in tier one, regardless if they have a disability, if they're an English learner, et cetera. All students will receive high quality tier one. I do want to pick up on the other part of your question that it's important to understand where students are with respect to the continuum of learning so that I am providing very personal differentiation within the tier one. Um, however, that may not be just enough, right? Some students may need more. And so that progressive levels of intensity may mean a tier two, maybe a small group of students, say six to eight students, and they'll get more targeted support uh, at that ratio with a group of six to eight uh, students per interventionist or per teacher. Um, tier three, if students aren't responding to tier, tier two, based on the data, they may move to uh, um, another progressive level of intensity and maybe we're down to two or three or four students uh, per, per staff ratio during that personalized learning time. And that's where you can get a little bit more intense, more targeted, more uh, explicit systematic instruction in the tier three level. Thank you. And then one other thing, um, tier one, tier two, and tier three with, um, according to um, the RTI model, um, when they're in tier two, tw tier three, that's essentially a pullout, um, but they still get the tier one instruction in addition to the pullout, correct? Yes, thanks for that. That's an important clarification. Thank you. Every every student will get tier one, and then if they are identified in need of tier two and tier three, that is in addition to um, tier, tier one. So if I'm a student that's in need of tier two intervention, I'm getting my tier one instruction with all my classmates in the, in the general, general education classroom, and then uh, what What's appropriate for me, maybe go to go to uh, during personalized turning line, go get some math intervention or some reading intervention based on the data that I've gotten from the screener. Um, so, but all of that is in addition to tier one. So it's not a pull out from tier one. It's in addition to. Thank you. Thank you. 
<laughs> you will be our last question, Ms. Player. Um, can, can a student skip a question since it's computerized? They, they can actually move forward and back, okay. um, and then the system will tell them, if, you know, with, at the end, sort of a summary on which questions, if they need to go back, you have you haven't answered question A, a for example, before they actually submit. Okay. Thank you so much for providing all of this information, especially the tone setting information and just like the base layer. I really appreciate that as a practice for us, not only for us, but everybody. And I appreciate it. Years ago. It's very helpful. Yeah. <laughs> Thank and you. If too. I could add one more thing to that, um, I have talked with several teachers and principals related to this new model, and they have been excited about the uh, about the work that's happening and the potential for the future as they continue to refine the model and. Really Really make it work and support students and instruction so I really appreciate it all right that moves us on to governance issues thank you so much um, may we have removed or pulled out excuse me uh, action 1 B 4 and 1 B 11 may I have a motion to approve the consent agenda with those amendments so moved. do I have a second, second. Thank you. All those in favor, please raise your hand of approving the consent agenda as stated. Thank you. All right. Uh, item 1B4 was pulled off by Ms. Tyler. So, Ms. Tyler, will you please have your question? Yes. Um, so, <coughs> just I guess a real quick, I don't. Um, so, this is about um, procuring. Um, uh, bipolarization, I don't have the number, I don't have the word right in front of me. Yeah, bipolar ionization devices for multiple MMPS schools to improve indoor air quality. Um, and so several, I just had a bunch of different questions, so I think I'll just kind of go through one at a time instead of just asking all of them and then waiting. Um, so my first one is um, just about the amount that we're spending. It's about $4.5 million, and so I was just asking about kind of like the RFP and making sure that that's commiserate with what we're seeing everywhere. Um, yes, that is um, correct. Um, as I'm speaking, I'll ask, if you don't mind, um, Chief Sullivan, to come on up to the podium. Um, you're correct. The amount we're spending is in line with the product type. Um, we went through our um, set process, and the winning bid was the lowest of the five bids uh, we received. Um, the, actually, the highest was more than double um, what we currently have before you. Okay. And then my next... Um, and two questions kind of go together. How many units are we expecting to receive from this, and um, where are how are we choosing where they go and and where they're placed? Yeah, if my uh, understanding is we have over eleven thousand, um, eleven thousand or more um, units that we're planning to receive. And Chief Sullivan, if you want to answer the second question about um, placement. She's good, isn't she? Yeah, on it. She does everything. Uh, she, uh, they will be at every school. Okay. And so every classroom, every school? Yes, ma'am. Okay. So it's not, schools are not going to have to pick and choose who gets one. That's not, no. Perfect. That's, that was a concern of mine. Um, so they will be available for every classroom. Um, will they also be in larger rooms or will they not be as effective in a room that's larger than what they can handle, like a cafeteria, for example? They will be in every space. Okay. So it's, uh, it goes into, um, into our, um, into our, uh, air units, air handling units, each individual one. Okay. Duck work. Excuse me. Okay. So it's not a standalone. It is not a standalone. Okay. And then I guess, so knowing that, um, just wanted to check in on, you know, the make and the model of what we're going to be receiving and um, where it falls along the lines of quality against what else is available on the market. What did you say? Yes, ma'am. Um, it, uh, it is uh, a, again, fantastically priced product for what we saw, and it has um, really good recommendations uh, around the country and within the state as well. And um, I actually have uh, a, a um, piece of the product, if you would like to see it um, here today. Um, hold a moment. Yeah. Sure, we tell. Oh. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Play with it till it's your turn. <laughs> so 
David will bring those up. Mr. Prophet will bring those up and um, so you can see them. But as you can see, this is one. Um, there's another coming up as well. And uh, we have different types because you have different types of units within our district. We have different types of duct, duct work depending on when you had um, that HVAC uh, work done at your school and the age of your school. And so for each unit to go in uh, to work as a filtration system, you have to have something that will marry with that unit. So um, so this is what they look like, and they uh, they go in. Da, da, da. Um, they, uh, they go in as part of the unit. It is not a standard 110 um, plug-in, so it's much more energy efficient. And um, they do the they do their work by um, by creating more filtering than a standard um, air ionization product that you would buy at um, at your local hardware store and that you would plug in. Um, they aren't just filtering the air um, around them. They're actually um, asking, um, asking the particles with their technology to come out of the air and to become um, attached to each other and to be bigger um, so that they can then become filtered into um, into that unit and using a standard filter. Using a standard filter. Okay. So. Um, what about our portables? Are they also going to have access to these? Yes. Okay. And I guess those would be have to be more standalone, right? Or no? No. They yeah. make one that I was not able to get quickly. But they would go in the little. It's a strip that goes over the uh, intake piece of the that unit. And so as the air crosses over the needle points, which in this particular case are these two little pieces right here, mm -hmm. it creates an ionization which coagulates all of the particulate matter in the air to larger pieces so it's easier trapped within the filter. And it works on everyone, even if we have a window unit, if we have duct work such as this, uh, it works it's usually uh, taken in around wherever the uh, return air Mm -hmm. Grills are. That's where you'll find these located. And this is a picture. You can see it almost looks like a um, like a buzzsaw, almost kind of. You know, I mean, it's just a, that's the little strip that will go in. Um, great. That's really good to know. As somebody who used to teach in a portable, <laughs> it's really good to know that they're being taken care of. Um, and then I guess the, so originally I know groups and parents had say, hey, should we purchase this at the beginning of COVID? And we were told to let them know that it would not necessarily be helpful because the COVID particles were so small. Are these intended to filter out COVID particles or just help the air be more pure in general, not necessarily targeting COVID? What's this is this first. This is a commercial product. This is not a you can buy off the shelf mm -hmm. unit. First, I just want to establish this is not the same yeah. um, that was being requested at the beginning of COVID. But I'll let the team, as you can see, they very well researched and are very familiar with with all of our units. And quite frankly, um, when when my leadership team brought this to me early on in the process, we were ready to move on it because they'd researched and known this was the direction we wanted to go. But I received notice from the controller that we could not do it. Um, and so we're at this point now because after a few call, phone calls from us, a little pushback around it and other districts also wanted to move in this direction, they rescinded um, their um, initial communication that we could not um, do this. And so I, I'm just commending them on their research and background, knowing where we need to go and getting us to this point, which is why we're talking about it today. So go ahead. Just, just real quick, uh, what this does the, it's intended to take all particulate matter in the air. doesn't matter whether it's viral particulate matter, whether it's dust, mm -hmm. dirt, whatever may be flying around in your, your air. And it creates an electrolysis, if you will. Okay, And those negative particles bond to one another. So it doesn't matter whether it's a COVID particulate matter, which is extremely small compared to, mm -hmm. I won't get into the science real quick, but human hair is 100 microns. This is 0.13 microns. So way much smaller than, than you can imagine. But if it's in the air, this would allow it to gather to other particles and be collected in a normal 
uh, what I call a normal uh, filter that we use, which is around a MERV 10 mm -hmm. uh, filter. And then the last question is, I see that we're using ESSER funds for this. How long do these tend to last? Is there upkeep on them that we need to be concerned about? Because these sound great. I'm excited for them. I think anything we can do to improve the air quality in our schools is we should do it. Um, so just how, you know, what's what's the upkeep? How long are we going to be able to continue to, to use these appropriately? Thank you for your question. Team. Virtually no upkeep. Uh, once they're plugged in, they're they're good. Uh, I think there's a five to ten year warranty on them. I'm not quite sure on that, but it's a relatively long for something that's electronic. Uh, something that's relatively long. Mm -hmm. And then, um, is the intent that we would want to add them into like maybe a capital needs and and have them on a rotating basis? Is that the intent, or have we not thought about that at this point? I think the original intent is that this is likely going to be. At this moment, not considered a recurring um, expense for us because of the, you know, longevity of, of the product. And so I think that's to be determined um, once we get them installed into our uh, buildings. But right now, we're not considering this kind of a recurring okay. um, cost for us. Five to ten years down the road, we might start thinking in those terms. But right now, it would be one of those one-offs where an electronic piece mm -hmm. might not stop working and we have to mm -hmm. replace it. So. Okay, and then um, just last for my district, um, will these be in James Lawson High School because it's a brand new building? Uh, they will be installed in Lawson, but after after Lawson is open. Okay. Okay, and when will they be installed everywhere else? Uh, they're, well, once the contract's approved and we get the orders placed, the POs placed, and so on and so forth, that I'm going to guess within the next six months we'll start installing them and okay. then it'll go relatively fast. Okay, great. I really appreciate it. Thank you. This is this sounds very exciting, and I'm glad that we're following the science of saying that air quality matters, and that's more than just COVID. That's in general for learning air quality matters. So thank you. Thank you. May I have a motion for approval on 1B4? I move to approve. Second. Second. Thank you. All those in favor of approving 1B4, please raise your hand. Thank you. It's unanimous. We will move on to 1B11. I've missed Masters. All right. Um, so I see that we are increasing our contract for um, the Sown to Grow um, system. So, and it, it, it's written as provision of a navigator and student support system. Um, and I am just wondering, is this only for the system itself? Does this also cover um, staffing around the Navigator program? Um, and then also just wanting to do sort of a check-in on the outcomes around the program and, and sort of what, what sort of metrics we're tracking with that. Um, my understanding, there's no staff um, as a part of this contract. This is all around um, the program. And, of course, the Sound to Grow uh, program supports our signature initiative around our navigators. Um, and so what we are tracking is the impact. We're starting to track and evaluate, um, bringing some data to the table around the impact of our navigators on, uh, um, with um, our SEL um, goals. Um, so we have a SEL a focus outcome. We also have a transition focus outcome. Both are housed within Sown to Grow. So it's not an evaluation of that system, but um, in, in concert or in service to the work of, of our navigators. Um, and I'm just going to go just on some um, anecdotal data I have. Uh, we've been able to pull some very critical um, data to respond to out of Song to Grow. Um, our students and the feedback we receive from our students is that they see it as a very safe way um, to communicate um, how they're doing, what's top of mind. Um, it, in some cases, some critical things that we needed to respond to that flag our team um, and kind of 
um, spurs us in, into action. It is also the method by which I talked about the transition plans. That's where all of our transition plans, of course, we um, have a goal of 100% of transition plans for every student at every transition grade um, every year, uh, which we um, just about met that goal last year in its first year of implementation. But it's also, Sona Girl is also the place where our navigators provide feedback to our students. And so our students are entering um, their feedback. Our navigators are um, responsive to that feedback. And of course, it kind of triggers, um, Dr. Springer, tell me if you use another word, but it kind of triggers our collab collaborative referral process um, as well so that we know where our students are. But it is our safe kind of confidential way of getting feedback um, from students and allowing those navigators to support them, not only in the kind of face-to-face, -face, but when they're not together in a um, kind of electronic fashion. So are our staff, are they provided with additional compensation for serving in that navigator role? No, that is a part of um, our roles and responsibilities as adults. So, uh, of course, our goal um, and what we're um, matching is every student to a caring um, adult, which we know when research has been proven that that is critical um, to the successful pathway of a student um, in their building. And so it might not be, um, we're talking about smaller cohorts of students, so it might not be your class room teacher. Um, it could be an administrator, it could be a counselor, it could be front office staff, it could be anyone um, who has any role within that school community, which we've gotten lots of positive feedback um, about that as well. But no, it is a part of our um, um, natural kind of system and operations. Um, schools kind of go about it differently based upon their size of their school, how their daily structure um, is, is organized, but it is embedded in a part of the work that we do as educators and been a part of team. So it happens during the school day? For, for the most part. I mean, you might have a school here or there who has a leadership role around navigators and they charge someone with going in and making sure that we've met our goal around feedback for the week or just managing when new students come in, that they're connected to someone within our student management system. And so it just depends on the scale and scope of the navigator system within the school. If you might have additional roles outside of the day to just make sure the integrity of our navigator program is where we intend and plan for it to be. So when when do those conversations take place? Is it during a, a child's PLT time? It could very yeah, well. Okay. It could be during it could be during PLT. I mean, our schools have so many creative names and spaces uh, where they're having these conversations. But you could definitely see it during PLT. Some of them have. Um, I think Ebenezer has talked about it. They have kind of a advisor, mentor, mentee program um, at their school. Um, so it just depends on the school. And so what we have kind of established is our why around building these positive relationships with our students in a, in a small kind of cohort way. And we've allowed, with the right supports, of course, um, and tools like Sound to Grow, um, we've um, allowed our schools to kind of build it and integrate it into their own school culture. And so we're just supporting it from the lens of um, how it plays out in the school culture. But Sound to Grow in particular um, actually grew out of uh, feedback from, from our schools. And particularly, we have at one school who um, went that route initially um, and shared back with us how powerful Song to Grow was with, in, in coordination with our um, Navigator initiative. And so from that, we did some piloting with a few schools, and then we were able to take it to scale. But it actually came um, to us from feedback from one of our schools in particular. So is there, do the students have any sort of input on like wh who their navigator is or what their sort of pre-existing relationship might be with? Well, I mean, I think first and foremost, I think our schools know our kids and families best. And so they're going into this assignment with that information. Um, we have talked um, frequently about the ability to shift if needed. I mean, we want to make sure that they're positive um, relationships. So if you were assigned someone that I've had a really lasting positive um, relationship with, we could, you know, switch um, students um, if needed. But we're encouraging all of our schools to approach this with 
with leveraging existing relationships and positive connections that already exist. But what makes this initiative beautiful is that every student should have that. And so we're working to build that for every single student, every um, school, regardless of the school that you attend, that you have and are connected to someone who cares about you, who is checking in with you, providing you feedback, and then connecting you with um, wraparound services that you may need. I'm just, you know, I just want to ensure that it's, you know, it's something that are, the students can access, but also not an additional burden on teachers and staff, and making sure that they sort of have the supports they need. And like, what would the circumstance be if a teacher was dealing with a situation that just felt? you know, like too much for them with a student. It's what they would do in a classroom if they had a situation that they felt um, was burdened. They um, will solicit the support of maybe the school counselor or the assistant principal um, or the principal, but foundationally, it, there is not much we're going to accomplish in educating our students if we do not know our students and build positive relationships. That is foundational to everything um, that we do, and so there's no trade-off there. Uh, we we have to know our students. We have to have systems and structures for us to get there. Um, there has been, you know, considerations early on around the flexibilities and what they should look like, and we've taken that and we've made it adjustments um, as needed. But this is, I mean, nationally we're having this conversation, and nationally Nashville is leading it because other schools are trying to, other school districts are trying to figure out how to build such models because we cannot afford to have any one student who doesn't feel connected um, to their community. And and to um, their teachers and staff that, that they're working towards. And I've been in schools on school visits where kids have like nearly run me over because they've got to get to class and get their song to ground feedback um, into the system because they have something to say, right? And they want to share um, that information with us. And so we've encouraged our schools to integrate it into their school culture as best they could when they've struggled with that. I will tell you Chief Chen, Chief um, Springer um, have sat personally with teams as well as Chief Bellamy and um, um, Chief P Perry to make sure that we're helping them be thoughtful about what it could look like um, so that it is a natural part of the way we grow students in MPS. And quite frankly, when we're talking about the integration of academics and SEL, this is a perfect example of how we can make that happen. Do you have any idea, like, sort of on average, how much time teachers put into this? Um, like, I know it's spread out across, you know, all of the teachers and staff in a school, but I'm just kind of trying, like, in a typical teacher day, like, what portion of it is serving as a navigator? Do you want to respond to, to the specific question? Sure. <laughs> Here from both of us. Um, what we see, I think, in general, is a lot of different models that schools might employ. So, for example, if you have an advisory model that is built into your day, or like that is built in the structure of your week, so in those cases, we might see you have the time that you spend in advisory, plus if there's any time that you're grabbing right after class or during the day to check in with the students. It's hard to pinpoint a specific amount of time because when we see this done well, it's integrated into the school day, and it's integrated to other interactions that our adults are having with kids who they know well and know personally. So I don't, I don't want to ballpark a number because of that, but I think what we're seeing is it's, it's integrated in the structure of all of those wraparound supports you're providing in the context of a school day. And just for the for those who are listening in, we keep using the term or acronym PLT, that is personalized learning time. And again, I think this fits the definition um, when, you when we think about academics, but also SEL of that personalized um, time for our students. Dr. Springer, did you want to add anything? Yeah, I just was going to say that just today um, in a school, we heard about a school that has incorporated into their school day. And so on Mondays, every Monday, they have a set aside time school wide for teams to check in with students uh, to provide feedback and also for students to uh, look at the goals that they have set within some to grow to make sure that they are tracking so this is a weekly routine for this one specific school that is the type of implementation we are uh, want to highlight but again there are just different models across different schools uh, in our district and again it's every student every student I would imagine appreciates an opportunity to share voice connect um, build those relationships and of course we know what all the Research says around having at least one caring adult um, that every student, and we are going for m much more than that, but this is a way to ensure that that's happening um, across every one of our schools. Thank 
you. I just, and I want to just reiterate, PLT time can be used for this because I know, as you said, different schools are implementing it in different ways. And so I think it's really important, you know, if a school is having trouble with the implementation that they can maybe lean to a replicable model. Like the, oh, we take Mondays as our sort of check-in day just to be sure it can fit well within all of the teachers week without, you know, pro providing an undue burden, but that all of the children are also having access to it. Um, because I think, you know, it, it probably isn't as helpful for the student if it's the teacher they're talking to is stressed out and rushed about the whole process. So just sort of thinking about that as, um, like Dr. Bellamy, as you're just talking with different principals about how they're structuring their day. Um, I appreciate that. Absolutely. And to just point out one thing, this is not new um, for sure for our high schools who've had um, the advisory time since its inception. And so it's just a structured way, um, an intentional strategic way that we want to make sure that we're connecting um, with our students. And then the state gifted us with um, the PLT um, time as well. Um, and so we're going to make the best of that time to connect with our students and make sure that it is really personalized and individualized to the needs of our students. All right. Can I have a motion to approve 1B11? So moved. Can I have a second from one of them? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> it's been first and seconded. If you are... Uh, in approval, if you if you want to vote uh, in the affirmative of that, please raise your hand. I apologize for the confusion there. Thank you. That's unanimous. All right, announcements. We will start with District 3. What? Well, no, that's fine. You're just like, I'm, it never starts with me. So. Well, District 1 is gone. Oh, okay. <laughs> and I'm District 2. I'm used to being last. Okay. Thank you for that. Um, I just want to once again um, commend the work of our insurance trust and once again say that we have the best benefits in maybe in America. I'm just saying it's, it's better than state benefits, it's better than metro benefits, and it's a collaborative effort, and I think that's where we do our best work because when I go to those insurance trust meetings to represent the board, there are teachers there and there are MMPS staff members there and there's our amazing insurance trust people. That, anyway, so all that. I just need to say that. Um, I also want to mention that this Friday at 6 p.m. in the band room at Stratford High School, um, there will be a special ceremony honoring John T. Wade, um, a MMPS alum and former MMPS teacher. Um, I unfortunately will not be able to attend, so I'm hoping maybe Maybe some of my board colleagues can represent at that event. I will be at family weekend at my child's college this weekend doing fall things. Um, also just wanted to once again um, say um, how much in awe I am of Miss Jeannie Pupa Walker and her amazing service on this board. She was a mentor to me. I had the pleasure of um, serving uh, along with her on the governance committee and I learned so much from her and I'm just so appreciative of all of her um, contributions. And um, I think I will leave it at that. District 4. Hi, a couple of announcements. Um, I so Pencil um, has the upcoming principal for a day um, this Thursday. Um, I'm excited to be joining um, the principal at DuPont, Tyler, uh, DuPont Hadley Middle School along with his students and staff, uh, Dr. Kevin Armstrong. Um, also on November the 10th, we will have our first district-wide PAC meeting uh, from 5.30 to 7 at the Wellness Center um, right across from um, the boardroom. Um, and then early voting has started um, in all 12 voting locations across Davidson County. Uh, please look at the Davidson County Election Commission, or you can go to my social media, um, where it has all the voting locations. I encourage you to take your family, a friend, your neighbor, um, take the dog if you want to. Go vote. Um, and vote, vote, vote. Thank you. Excuse me, District 5. 
Uh, tomorrow we'll have, at, no, I'm sorry, not tomorrow, Thursday at 5 o'clock p.m., Jones Padilla Elementary will host their Hello Steam event because, you know, 37208 strong. We are Pearl Cone Cluster. We have Pearl Cone Cluster Pride. That's it. Thank you. District 6. Okay, so good news, good news, good news. Um, I want to first give a shout out to uh, Cane Ridge High School's own Siobhan Abdullah, who is, get this, the starting quarterback, kicker, and punter at Cane Ridge High School. He was awarded tickets to Super Bowl 57 this past Sunday at the Tennessee Titans game uh, by none other than Commissioner Roger Goodell. And I was there to see it, so I was really excited. I was screaming from the top of my lungs in my seat and nobody around me cared that that was one of my kids but I cared a lot <laughs> so I appreciate you congratulations to Siobhan on that also and in honor of this this is why I'm dressed like a high school gym teacher today um, want to give a big shout out to MAPCO and our entire Antioch community for participating in the Fueling Our Future promotion that supported Antioch High School Athletics. MAPCO donated a check for $7,000 to our Bears, and that is uh, absolutely a great show of support of our students. And so I started thinking about this um, because I, I love teachable moments. So I posted this on my socials today, uh, and this is for our uh, anybody who is, uh, and you'll understand why, Dr. Williams, I asked about the uh, the uh, non-traditional questions in just a second. Um, so here's a word question. MAPCO donated $7,000 to Antioch High School based on a 25 cents per gallon donation per gallon donated to, uh, donate per gallon purchased. So the question is, approximately how many vehicles were involved in this promotion <laughs> if we assume each vehicle's gas tank holds about 30 gallons of gas? That's a huge I'm just saying. <laughs> For all the press yeah. Yes. So, and the answer is, I'm sorry, did I hear an answer? Oh, we was I'll give it to you. Out. Hold on. <laughs> <laughs> or that's a non-calculator question. <laughs> that's a non-calculator problem. So I'll give you a, the answer. 933.333. So that's approximately the number of vehicles that came through to purchase gas that went directly to support our athletics program at Antioch High School. So that's great. And I commend them. And I'm so excited for them for that. And finally, I will be participating in Pencil's Principal for a Day this Thursday. I will be at the invitation of, of Mrs. Myrie at Cambridge Early Learning Center. I'm super excited to be with the little babes. So I will be there for um, drop-off at 7.30 in the morning. That should be, I should have a lot to report after that. Um, oh, and, and I'm sorry, one last thing. Uh, our next community meeting for District 6 will be on November 15th at the Southeast Branch Library in the large community room at 6.30 p.m. and all this information will be on my socials. So, thank you. Thank you. District 7. See, we just we geeked out with you. We're taking it to the very end. Um, so October's October is breast cancer month. Um, I encourage everyone to get screened. Um, I, this summer I was diagnosed with breast cancer. I am doing fine, so no worries. But the reason I did it and going to Miss Masters' part is because I got a call. Um, I participate in the MMPS insurance about a breast cancer screening, and I was on a wait list. But I went ahead and decided to get my mammogram and, just, and to do it with the Vanderbilt Clinic. So going back to our great insurance. Um, please to the staff, especially to the women. The women of color get screened. Uh, we tend to die from breast cancer at a 4% higher rate than our white counterparts. Because um, if you catch it early, it's curable, it's survivable, and um, you have to go do less intensive um, treatment and therapy. So please, please, please get your mammogram so you can be there in the classroom. We want you in the classroom and not outside the classroom. So if you can please do that, um, be appreciated. Thank you. Date. <clears throat> Let me just start by saying thank you to Miss Player for her bravery in um, both what she has been going through herself, but also in taking the time to champion a breast cancer awareness for everyone. So thank you for that. We appreciate it. Um, 
a quick shout out um, again to um, Miss Emily Riley from Julia Green, who was one of the CMA um, uh, teachers of the year. Um, this week at Hillsboro High School is their college week, um, and uh, lots of different activities happening every day. Um, but next, um, see, next Tuesday night, is that right? Is next Tuesday night, November 1st? Yes, it oh is. Oh my gosh, everybody get your Halloween costumes. <laughs> uh, next Tuesday night is Hillsboro's college night. Um, all are welcome. They're going to have more than 20 colleges um, available, also help filling out FAFSAs, et cetera. Um, so please um, do come and attend that. Um, this Friday night at Hillsborough is Future Boroughs Night. So for all feeder schools in the Hillsborough cluster, there will be trick-or-treating. I should have put this all together with the fact that Halloween's on Monday. Trick <laughs> on Friday, there will be trick-or-treating, costumes, free hot dogs, free hot dogs, um, and food um, available. Also, congrats to Hillsborough again for um, the women uh, of the volleyball team for being fourth in the state. Uh, JT Moore um, and West. West End are both in the volleyball uh, championships or um, competition. Um, and for West End, this is the first time they've been in for, um, I think it's something like 20 years. So congrats to them. And I got really lucky. And tonight, the JT Moore girls who are in the soccer tournament got pushed back um, until tomorrow night so I can go to the game. Um, so shout out and good luck to those ladies as well. Um, and my next office hours will also be November 15th, 6 p.m. Um, uh, location to be determined, but probably somewhere in Sylvan Park. So thanks. Thank you. District 9. Um, I'm following along with our voting news. Early voting has started. The Bellevue Library opened up today for early voting. So I want to encourage anybody who, um, I want to encourage everybody who has registered to vote to go and do it. Um, doing it sooner is better because then you don't forget. So um, early voting is great to help you with that. There will be a Bellevue Votes Festival at the Red Caboose Park this Saturday. Um, Caleb Hemmer will be sponsoring that. It will be from 11 a.m to 3 p.m. with bounce houses, free food, golf cart rides to vote at the Bellevue Library, and more. So there will be um, Blinky's Offset Barbecue Food Truck will serve free eats from 1130 till they run out. So if you need an excuse to come and vote, come on out, let your kids jump around in the bounce houses, get some food, and go do your civic duty. Um, so that's exciting. And then on... Wednesday, November 2nd at 6 p.m., Bellevue Ford Ice Center, the Predators, will be hosting a special event to announce the mascot, colors, and logos for James Lawson High School, which will be open this fall. We're all very excited about it, and we hope that you're able to tune in and get just as excited as we are. So, thank you. Thank you. All right. Student board member, Elena. I want to once again shout out the Hillsborough's volleyball team. I got to go see them Tuesday, Wednesday, one of those days um, at the state tournament. So they did really good. I think they finished fourth in the state. So very proud of them. Um, also, I think this might be the last week of football for the regular season. So go and see all the sports teams. Um, and... I hope everyone had a great fall break, and I hope we can get the second quarter started off wonderful. So, yeah. <clears throat> Thank you. Uh, District Y today, uh, report cards were sent home, so make sure that you check your kids' uh, backpacks. And as mentioned earlier, parent-teacher conferences are on Friday. As always, if you need more than 15 minutes with your teacher, don't forget that you have that access. And you can easily ask your teacher for that additional feedback. They are more than happy to help you help your student. And so that's always available to you, and it's not just on Friday. Um, at uh, Overton, there's been a lot of going on. They had the Crucible, and as always, Bobcat players did a great job because they're the Bobcat players. They do a great job. Um, they also had recently, uh, I'm so sorry, but we, we beat Antioch pretty bad, and that's our, our main rival. Uh, and so we beat them 46 to 0. I'm just saying. I'm just saying it was 46 to 0. Um, and it was a great bounce back, and we're proud of it. Yeah, since uh, Cambridge beat you guys uh, a couple of weeks ago. We're not but I have something about for you. That. We will talk later. <laughs> So we're very 
excited about that at Overton. Uh, it was a very exciting time. Uh, additionally, there's been some wins with cross country. Uh, the boys uh, have second at the MMPS lead, uh, championship, and Coach Hughes and Deliga won the District 12 Coaches of the Year as well for TWS Delay. And uh, Overton also hosted at the beginning of October, though it's been some time since we have seen everybody. Um, they hosted the marching Metro Marching Band Classic, and I really appreciate so many of so my colleagues. So much fun. So yeah, much fun. Great. I really appreciate a lot of my colleagues and a lot of our staff being there. Um, it was a, a lot of a lift for our teachers and staff there, particularly because it happened to be during homecoming week. But it was really wonderful, and it was great to have an entire MMPS event for high school students. Um, and my children will not stop talking about it. And you all are all welcome that my dad decided to not bring his tuba, though though he warned. He warned that he might. And uh, Oliver is still undefeated in their football season, and last week was their homecoming. Uh, on board news, we have some, some big board news. So first I want to say um, that we are very excited, though it may be a little sad because she is my work wife. Um, <laughs> uh, Ms. Christian Bugs is now engaged, and so we are so... <laughs> excited for her and Mike. You are definitely going to be seeing her show the hand during the photos. That's what the posing was earlier, if you missed it. Um, but we are very excited for you. I am so happy for your blessings and we're happy, happy for you. Also, in information that we are just overjoyed about, as we discussed earlier, this uh, past month was um, Hispanic Heritage Month, but it's also been Breast Cancer Awareness Month. Breast cancer has affected our board. Our board members uh, passed and current, as discussed, and we're just overjoyed with your progress and that um, radiation will be ending soon and everything else. And so we are just so appreciative, and we want to encourage, of course, all of our teachers and staff as well to continue to be tested and watch and take care of yourself. It's important to us that you are, that you're okay, not just for our students, though it is important to us, but you are our employees and you are important to us. So please take, take care of yourself. Other than that, I appreciate everybody being here in this meeting is adjourned. Oh, Thanks. one last thing. No. Only eight Christmases left, eight Tuesdays left until Christmas. I'm just yeah, putting it fair. out there. It's not about <laughs> Cane Ridge. So. <laughs> <laughs> I, heard I, heard I do have something for you. <laughs>